So this is my firstborn. She's four years old, but let's not get confused by the white tendrils and the angelic smile. This girl is a shrewd negotiator. <laughs> One of her many, many schemes is to convince us to let her reserve something for later if we won't let her have it in the moment. She'll ask for a cookie. The answer is no. She'll nod respectfully, ringlets bouncing, and she'll ask for the same thing in a slightly different way. Can she put a cookie on the kitchen table? When we ask why she wants to do that, she says that perhaps later, if we're being a bit more reasonable, the answer will be yes, and if it is, the cookie will be ready for her. <laughs> this is surprisingly effective. At any given time in our house, the kitchen table is littered with objects and treats over which my child is in current negotiations. And yet, by bedtime, the table is always magically cleared of clutter. She's an example for women everywhere. <laughs> Especially my young female students. When I first took a faculty position, I didn't take into account or really prepare for what's become the most substantial and most rewarding aspect of this job, which is mentoring women. All these individual talks I've had with them, I've seen some common themes emerge, things that they're all struggling with. In general, the women that speak to me are in the middle of a negotiation. And I don't mean a salary negotiation, but we go over and over how they deserve at least equal pay. I mean they're in the middle of a life negotiation. They're negotiating for the life they want. Now, it's humbling to me that students in my general age bracket come to me with some life advice, but they come to me because I'm an expert. Well, I gave birth to an expert. My daughter has taught me three very effective negotiating strategies I pass on to my students as they negotiate for the life they want. The first of these strategies is that one choice does not eliminate another. My daughter doesn't see how negotiating for a cookie now in any way makes her ineligible for a popsicle later. And yet, an hour after she's eaten the cookie, when she's strong-arming strong us for the popsicle, she's truly baffled when we explain to her, you've already made your choice. She doesn't see how one choice ever eliminates another. And yet, my students believe if they pursue a certain degree or they take a certain job, they've made a choice that's rendered them ineligible for any other choices. All of my students that come speak to me um, are multifaceted. They have lots of skills, lots of things they can see themselves doing. One student in particular was in my office a few weeks ago going over her career path in the nonprofit sector. But then she was also lamenting that she couldn't also be an artist in New York. And when I said, why can't you? She said, well, those two choices, they don't make sense together. So she's going to have to make one choice at the expense of the other. We've had that drilled into our heads, that you have to make a choice. The choice. Choose a major. Select a career. Pick a small dot far off on the horizon and spend your entire life aiming at it. Now, my four-year-old daughter would find that line of thinking ridiculous. And I tend to agree. As a faculty member at this university, I help run a graduate program that prepares students to be leaders in the public and nonprofit sector. I believe in what I do. I love what I do. But my path to this job wasn't a straight line headed at a small dot. It wasn't a single choice I made in the distant past. Unlike most academics, my job wasn't even in my career plan so much as five years ago. I was actually an English and creative writing major in college. Now, there's a choice I think some people questioned at the time, especially my parents. But I chose what interested me. And even though my graduate work and my research and my subsequent faculty position are in an entirely different field from English, writing is still part of my career. Writing is my career. I'm a creative nonfiction writer and an author. I write for magazines and websites. I run a blog. And last year, I published a book that ranked in the top 10 humorous books on Amazon. In my daughter's worldview, the choice to be a professor is the cookie. The choice to also pursue writing is the popsicle. One choice didn't and doesn't eliminate another. But I get how students struggle with how to make sense of multiple choices in one career, how to aim their arrow at multiple dots. 
And when my book came out last summer, I was conflicted about how separate I should keep these endeavors. Up until that point, they had been dirty secrets from one another. But I was surprised at the book launch when I looked out in the big crowd. The first row was filled with my female students. Unbeknownst to me, my students had been reading my writing all along. They had read my own very candid accounts of my own negotiating in life. And that's the reason they were coming to me at the university. My creative writing career had unintentionally fostered healthy relationships at the university. These two career choices I've made at two different times and for two very different reasons make perfect sense together when I stopped worrying about the definition. Choices overwhelm us when we see them as defining our life or defining our career or narrowing us toward that dot. But I'd argue choices are the very way we can remove the definition of our life and our career. And I'd also argue the less defined your career is, the more protected it is. If people can't explain what it is you do, they can't come after it. That's the career advice. Live a life and build a career your parents can't explain to your grandmother. And that's what I tell my students when they come to me and they're grappling with the single life or career choice. I tell them, it doesn't have to be this belabored. Play to your strengths, pursue your passions, and your life and your career are going to take shape and make sense all on their own. And whatever it is, whatever this single choice is you're grappling with, it's not going to eliminate another. The second negotiating strategy I've learned from my four-year-old child is to have it all by never giving your all. My daughter will come to us and strong arm us again for a brand new toy. Now, if in a moment of weakness or sheer exhaustion or to get us through Target, we agree, her immediate response is, well, then how about two new toys? Now, my child is never concerned with how she's going to play with two toys at the same time. She's only concerned about the things she wants, and she's stockpiling. Now, society, society loves to ask if women can have it all. And our gender should never feel compelled to dignify that with an answer. But I understand that my students are grappling over whether or not they're going to be able to give their all to everything they want to do in this life. It's not just current students. I meet with many prospective students for the program. And last semester, I met with one young woman in particular who I've never seen anyone this fired up about her program. She had an intense desire to return to graduate school, a true passion for the field. And so as we were concluding our meeting together, I said, I look forward to your application. I look forward to reviewing your application very soon. And I was met with hesitation. And she said, well, I'm not going to apply right now. I've got to wait until it's the right time so I can really give this my all. Now, I'm sure that's just an expression. But that right there, that's become the rhetoric and the practice of my generation of women, this concept of giving your all. Give your children your all. Give your all to your spouse. Give that career of yours all you've got. But that unwarranted and unnecessary pressure, all that does is make women hesitate for something they really want to do. It's OK if you don't want kids, or you don't want to pursue graduate school, or you have no interest in establishing and nurturing a career path. But let's say you do want any or all of those things. The worst thing you can do is wait around for the time in which you can give it your all. I won't get into the graphic details of this, but my husband and I planned to get me pregnant when I was in the middle of my graduate degree. We were successful. Again, none of your business. <laughs> and people at the time really thought this was crazy. And it did become quite difficult when I was slogging away at a dissertation with a newborn baby on my lap. But the reality is, I relished in the fact that I was making progress on everything I wanted in this life. Now, if I had waited until I had the time to give it my all, I currently wouldn't have a PhD or any children. Now, sometimes my kid got drive through nuggets when I had to run data. And sometimes my dissertation sat idle for weeks when my kid was sick, but it was never about being able to give my all. We have to stop talking about this. Women have to stop thinking like this. You physically can't and emotionally shouldn't give your all to any one thing. 
So instead, give your sum to a lot of things. And that's what I want my female students to know. Of course, you can have it all. But not if you start putting one aspect of your life on hold to benefit another. Try my four-year-old strategy and just stockpile everything it is you want, and you will sort it out later. It's never actually required to give your all to all those things at the same time. So take the pressure off yourself and go have it all by never giving your all. The final negotiating strategy I've learned from my four-year-old child is don't confuse your wants with someone else's. I was cautioned when my second daughter was born that my oldest would become very jealous. All of a sudden, my oldest would have to compete for resources that had once been solely available to her. Everything I read and every season mother warned me of how competitive siblings can be, especially girls. So I braced myself when my youngest daughter was born for sibling rivalry and female competition. Don't let this picture fool you. There were certainly times that they were competing for my attention. But as they grew together, I came to see they weren't really competitors. So my oldest daughter doesn't care anything about this little red dinosaur we have until she would see her younger sister want to play with it. And then my oldest would become immediately entrenched in a cutthroat battle over something she doesn't care about. She would look at her sister and assume she wanted the same thing. She was confusing her wants with someone else's. Now, I saw how my older daughter reconciled this in her head one day. We were in the playroom, and the youngest child was playing with the red dinosaur. And my four-year-old looked around and realized, hey, all the other toys are up for grabs. And so for that point forward, as best a four-year-old can, she stopped confusing her wants with someone else's. Now, it's not a new concept to hear that women can be competitive with one another. I certainly strongly believed that women were competitors. It was just part of my conditioning in junior high. But over the years of mentoring women and watching my two daughters get along better than anticipated, I've come to see that we aren't really in competition with each other. Because the competition implies we're vying for the same goal, mutually and equally engaged in a competition over the exact same thing. Now, I know a lot of women. I'm friends with women. I teach women. I'm raising two little women. I see women walking around. And I've never once seen two women try to do the exact same thing. Not once. Even all of my female students who are in the same age bracket and are pursuing the same specific degree program, none of them have the same career goals or life aspirations. I mean, we rarely have two women running for president in the same election year, and even then, it's never on the same side. No two women are ever trying to do the exact same thing. So if we're not vying for the same goal, we're not competitors. So what are we doing? We're comparing. And comparing is a very different and much more dangerous thing because comparison creates arbitrary metrics for your life and your success, and it puts arbitrary deadlines for when those things should happen. I had a student in my office um, a few semesters ago. She had just started the program, and she came to me and said, in no uncertain terms, she had to start the program and get out in record time. Whatever the quickest way out, I needed it. When I asked her why she wanted to do that, wanted to speed the process up, she said she had to graduate so she could have kids by the time she's 30. Now, I didn't have her full medical chart in front of me, so I don't quite know where that pressure was coming from, but I can argue that it's probably from looking around at her circle of friends or in society and putting an arbitrary deadline on your life, confusing your wants with someone else's. When I first became a mother, I was out of my element. And my parenting in that first year was based solely on what I saw other mothers doing. One mother in particular, who's fantastic, talked endlessly about the benefits and the importance and the sheer joy of making her own organic baby food. <laughs> my interpretation of this at the time was, well, if I wanted my child to have a shot at Harvard, I was going to need a hand mixer. <laughs> so that first year of parenting, despite being in doc a doctoral program and an adjunct professor and a new mom, you could find me at home for hours on end ignoring my child, 
in the kitchen, elbow deep in farmer's market squash. <laughs> Sautéing it, pureeing it, blending it, pouring it, serving it up to my six-month-old who would immediately spit it out in disgust. I'm not a terribly great cook. But I would start that process over and over because this was important. Now, one day I was at the grocery store, and I don't know if I just don't ever look around, but guess what I saw? Jars and jars and jars of organic baby food, just aisles of this stuff. <laughs> and I picked it up, and I looked at the baby on the label, a very happy, well-adjusted looking, Harvard-bound <laughs> baby. And I thought, wait, what am I doing? What I was doing was spending an inordinate amount of time on something that was never a priority for me. Like my oldest child, I looked around at other mothers and I immediately became entrenched in something I have never cared about. There is not a distant version of myself that couldn't wait to blend avocado and rhubarb in a BPA-free container. I don't even like to cook. But I was comparing myself to these other mothers, and it set me up for failure because, as I said before, these women didn't have the same goals as I did, not in parenting and not in life. But that knee-jerk reaction, that comparison, that pressure, that panic, that crops up in other aspects of my life, not just parenting. It crops up in my professional life especially as a female in the field of academics or as a female writer in the cutthroat world of book publishing. It is hard not to look around at other scholars and other authors and not be intimidated, not to immediately compare myself. Did you know my book is in the same category as Mindy Kaling's and Tina Fey's? That's rough. But I've got to remember why it is I wrote my book, what my plans were with my life. I can't get bogged down in this comparison because I will look around and I will confuse my wants for someone else's. We're all negotiating for the life we want, what we're willing to give and what we need to get. And I'm particularly invested in making sure my female students feel like they're equipped to negotiate for the life they want. And when they come to me, I hope that my advice is helpful. I hope that our conversations are productive. But the truth is, I'm just borrowing the advice I give to them because I'm relying on the wisdom of my demanding, opinionated, negotiating daughter at home, begging for a cookie to put on the kitchen table until later. Because she's the one that's taught me everything I need to know about being a woman. Ask for everything you want, find a way to have it all, and leave nothing on the table. Thank you.